Okay, now I'm going to share the screen. You need to let me share the screen, host. practiced all this. Ready? All right. Okay. Welcome to another edition of the Stack Choir Presents. This uh, month we're going to talk about pre-Hispanic music in Latin America. And let me mute my phone because it's going to be very talkative. Alright. So, we, as I, as I was telling you before, I found so much information that I just could not, I couldn't stop <laughs> and I wanted to share more and so I decided to do um, part one today and part two next month. We didn't have anybody teaching in June so that worked out fine. My name is Eliet de Salazar and thank you for being here. Alrighty, let's start with the introduction. Um, first, what? let's talk about what pre-Hispanic... Oh, if anybody has questions, please type them on the chat or hold it to the very end so that um, we can have it at, um, all, all the questions together. Thank you. So let's talk about pre-Hispanic period. Um, what is pre-Hispanic? So it's before the Spanish exploration and conquest in 1492. Tariq, is, um, as an archaeologist, was uh, um, telling me that I should not say 1492 because it's not really an exact date because it was different for um, all the countries in Mesoamerica. So it started in 1492, but it's debatable when it started in different countries. If anybody's interested in in continuing this research, um, the, the fields that you need to look into is musicology, which is this scholarly analysis and research-based study of music, uh, archaeomusicology, and the music manifestations of ancient cultures, ethnomusicology, the study of the music of different uh, cultures, especially non-Western ones, and organology, the science of musical instruments and their classifications. So we talked about what prehistoric, uh, pre um, um, Hispanic is. Now let's talk about what Latin America is right now. Right now, Latin America is 20 countries. You can see them there, and one territory, Puerto Rico, which belongs to. Territory for the United States. So, as you can see, there's a lot of countries, so there's going to be a lot of variations. You cannot say that it's one thing. There are things in common, of course, but. So, when we talk about period, what is Latin America? Pre Hispanic Latin America and colonial Latin America implied many, many cultures as well. And the most important one being the Mayas, the Aztecs, and the Incas. The Mayans, the Maya, are the native people of Mexico and Central America, as you can see in the map. Um, and all the, everything that I used is in the references, so. The Aztecs covered most of the North American, North, Northern Mesoamerican, Mesoamerica between 1345 and 1521. The Inca, uh, flourished in the ancient Peru between 1400 and 1533 and extended across the Western South America. Uh, 
Um, let's talk a little bit about music now. What is the music? What can we talk about music in in uh, pre-Hispanic Latin America? So we know that the recent research is is telling us that there's a lot, a lot of uh, music development in the pre-Columbian period and in those cultures that I, I told you about. According to Dr. Sanchez, I'm going to be referring to Dr. Sanchez a lot, um, their music was based on a pentatonic scale, which means five scale notes, um, five note scale. And according to Dr. Nagore Ferrer, uh, being a musician was very prestigious. It was an important position in society. And so even though a lot of the ceramic, um, we have a, a lot of ceramic instru uh, instruments that have survived pre-conquest and little is known how they were used before Spaniards conquer conquered the native cultures. Then another thing that I wanted to mention that is going to be very important later on in some of the instruments is the concept of her hetero heterophony, I'm sorry, <laughs> which is the texture resulting from simultaneous performances of melodic variants of the same tune. So if you hear it, you're going to say that's totally out of tune. And but Apparently, this was a constant um, thing because it, in many of the findings, there were instruments that were that sounded like out of tune. So we 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 can say that that they meant to do it like that. It's, it was not an accident. And uh, according to Dr. Sanchez, uh, Mesoamericans were interested in producing sounds with correspondence in terms of frequency rather than in terms of tones. So when when was music used? According to Nagore, it was for celebrations, re religious uh, rituals, and something that Largo Martin defines as epic legislative songs, which is like events that were important in their lives, like they, they, that ruled their lives. According to Sanchez, it was used for religion, for war, for therapeutic, therapeutic purposes, and this is very interesting too, that some instruments during their performance were considered manifestations of their deities. I heard this in one of the presentations, and one of the research, um, um, studies and I thought that this was very interesting and I wanted to share with you um, they were saying that pre-hispanic music is more accessible for our modern culture like anybody can pick up an, an ocarina and blow in it and make sounds it may not be sound beautiful for some people for some people some people may produce beautiful sounds but at least it's more accessible you can pick it up and, and learn faster. But in contrast with instruments from other parts of the world. That is for us, of course, because we're gonna see that for them in their culture, it was, since it was very prestigious, it was also very difficult. Um, so according to Dr. Francis, Musicians were under a lot of pressure because they had to follow exact rules. And errors in performance were scandalous and severely punished and even punished with death. Unfortunately, we don't have the rules. And I want to read this um, because I thought that it was very interesting. According to Donahue, musicians in pre-contact Mesoamerica were members of an elite class. As Stevenson points out, 
we can tell from the accounts of Spanish missionaries the following. Musicians belong to a professionalized castle, caste similar to the Levit Levitical guild, guild in ancient Israel and control public musical life. Training of an extremely rigid kind was prerequisite to a career in music since music itself was always thought of as a necessary adjunct to ritual, absolutely perfect performances such as only the most highly trained singers and players could give were demanded. Imperfectly executed rituals were thought to offend rather than to appease the gods, and therefore errors in the performance of ritual music such as missed drum beats carried the death penalty. Singers uh, and players, and at least of the Maya culture, of uh, the Maya, curtly dancers, because of the important part music played in their rituals, in their ritual life, enjoyed considerable social prestige. So, being a musician was, was tough. You had to have, you had to follow a lot of rules. Another important aspect that I wanted to share is that at least among the Aztecs, um, most the music was um, was uh, not a cappella, so they required always a, you know, instrumental accompaniment, and they were also accompanied by dance. Musical instruments also accrued mana which is the superpower, supernatural powers over time. And we're going to see at the end of the presentation, I'm going to tell you about um, a ceremony, a ceremony that where the, the person playing the instrument was a representation of their God. For instance. What are the limitations and the advantages of, of conducting a research on pre-Hispanic music. The limitations is exactly, uh, is um, we don't know when these manifestations took place exactly, we, who produced them, and so we're pretty much working with hypotheses as everything in archaeology. The advantages is that the instruments are a bridge in time, so the sounds that we're hearing right now are the sounds that were heard hundreds of years. That was super, that touched my heart because that brings me back to, that gives me um, a sense of belonging, at least to me. Um, the sources that, that I used for this research, I used pieces from, um, these museums, the Museo Chileno de Arte Precolombino, um, Museo de, del Jade de Costa Rica, Museo Nacional de Costa Rica, the Met, and the Museum of Natural History. So I went into their websites and checked the whatever they had with the, uh, the music, uh, musical instruments. I also used research of, conducted by museums. I used uh, research uh, conducted by uh, Gonzalo Sanchez. Um, that was uh, he conducted a study of the instruments in the Museo Al um, Amparo in Mexico. I also used um, research by Roberto Velasquez that he does a lot of death whistle, uh, a lot a lot of research on death whistle, and a lot of uh, reproductions. I also used um, the research uh, and the recordings by Andres Servilla and Juan Villaperros, and everything is available. They recorded this and uh, they share it. It's a project by the bank, Central Bank of Costa Rica. Again, you can find the, the links in the uh, references. I also used uh, Research conducted by Esteban Valdivia and Carolina Sagri um, in Ecuador. 
and research in um, Museo Chileno, so from Chile, and Museo de la Plata. My main my main purpose here was I wanted to share something that most people in the SA do not have access to because of the language. So since na Spanish is my native language, I wanted to find out what they had so that I could share it with you. And here are some of the, most of them, I think that I included them all. Like this is the one for, um, for Mexico. This is the, the, the person that does a lot of research on death vessel. This is uh, from Costa Rica where they were recording all the sounds for the instruments that we're going to be hearing. This is um, the Ecuador, Chile, and the research on Argentina. This is a series. So they do a lot of uh, talks on different things. And right now they're, going, they're doing one on... Uh, um, pre-Columbian instruments so you you guys want to check it out unfortunately all these resources are in Spanish but if you need help, um, I'll be happy to help. Um, I also use the codices and mostly the the Florentine codex the um, codex Borbonicus, Codex Laud, and Codex Becker. So what do we know about the codexes? At least this one, the Florentine Codex, um, it's called Historia General de las Cosas de Nueva España, General History of Things from New Spain. And this, it was written by, uh, uh, by France, Franciscan Friar Bernardino de Sa Sagaún. It was written between 15, uh, 58 and 1579. It, has, it is uh, comprised of 2,400 pages organized into 12 books. And it has more than 2,000 illustrations. Um, so, Something that I want to leave, like, uh, that I want to specify is that at least when, when I was doing the research, um, a lot of the, the academics want to make sure that this is very clear. That Mesoamerican music and European music are just different. There's not superior or inferior because we, we come from the understanding that cultures are just different. There's no superior or inferior cultures from a, at least from a linguistic point of view. Something important that we need to remember is that um, the Spanish vision of indigenous people were savages. So when they came to, to Latin America, to Mesoamerica, um they they didn't they did not see the culture the way we see it now however these cultures were incredibly rich for instance they had a something that they call a moxcali and tenoc must be killing me the way i'm pronouncing this because this is in in Nahua and i do not me too. and i cannot pronounce that <laughs> So they had this um, house of books um, that they had centuries of knowledge in books and all these books were um, unfortunately burned. And they had information on their cultures on many, many different fields. The documents were made in amate or agave or uh, deer skin paper. And were painted um, by writer painters called I can't say that 
Tenoch, you need to ten pronounce that. <laughs> Paquilos. Thank you. <laughs> and they received formal education since the, they were little. So this is very interesting because it is people had the idea that, that they were not that they were savages, but they were not really savages. It was just another way of seeing life. So upon the arrival of the conquerors, uh, documents were burned. And then Europeans went like, oh, wait a minute, we need to find out about these cultures. Some people say that they needed to find out about the cultures because they needed more information to, um, to conquer them. And um, so the so friars were given the task of promoting the, the reproduction of ancient writings. That's how we came up with most of the codices that we have right now. Of all the codices that um, we know about, only around 15 were rescued. And very, very little before uh, colonial time. So we have Mixtic codices. From the mixtic codices, we're going to talk about, we're going to see examples of the Codex Colombiano, Decker. And from the Aztec codices, we're going to talk, we're going to talk about the Codex Borbonicus and Codex Loud and the Florentine Codex. That's where I, you find a lot of instruments there. Um, nothing from the central Mexican origins or Mayan, at least in my research. Some of the cons uh, basic comments that we also need to talk about. This is all to build up before we start talking about the instruments. So we know that ceramic instruments uh, had animals or human forms. Uh, they, they were either simple or pretty adorned. Um, probably had ceremonial functions and when they were little they probably were like they put them on their necks mm -hmm. and some had uh, finger holes to allow for pitch variations so the way I'm gonna this we're gonna talk about the instruments is we're gonna use the the classification by I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce that. Compostel and sax. And this classification takes into consideration the way the sound is produced rather than the, mat the material. Um, I put this here that I wanted you to know that a, a lot of the, the images that I'm going to be using are by, uh, from the lecture that Gonzalo Sanchez gave. So there are four types of of instruments, idiophones, membra membranophones, chordophones, and aerophones. Idiophones are the ones produced, uh, the ones that produce sound by means of the actual body of the instrument, vibrating rather than a string membrane or a column of air. The sound depends on the material of the instrument. So more than the sound, the color of the, of the sound is going to depend on what it was made of, if it was wood, metal, or ceramic. Examples of this uh, type of instrument is rattles, bells, maracas, marimbas. The other type, um, another type is uh, Membranophones, and these primarily produce their sound by means of the vibration of the of a tightly stretched membrane. And the main example in this is drums. The third type is chordophones, and they primarily primarily produce their sound by means of the vibration of the strings that are stretched between fixed points. Like examples of these are the harp, the guitar. Something important here is that there is no evidence of 
this type of uh, instruments in Mesoamerica. And the last type is aerophones. They primarily produce sound by means of vibrating air. So the instrument itself does not vibrate and um, there are no instruments, there are no uh, vibrating strings or membranes. And this one, on the other hand, there's an ample corpus, corpus of uh, this type of instruments in Mesoamerica. And one of the researchers was saying probably because wind was very important in their cosmovision. So let's start with the idophones. This example is from the from uh, the Amparo, Amparo Museum, and as you can see, uh, this image is taken from the research by Gonzalo Sanchez. Over here we have um, a maraca, and and we can see the X-ray here. How it was, how it, it was made inside. Another uh, more examples on maracas here, and the important thing here is that most ceramic figures were feminine. So it has been suggested that um, they were a they were used to accompany voices, dances, or bring good health, especially in for children. So they were used for protection. Over here we have some more examples of uh, idophones, and we have rattles. These are taken from the bancos from Costa Rica. And some are gonna have audio, some are not, depending on the source. So we're gonna hear he, over here the bird-shaped rattle, the squash-shaped rattle, and the rattle with a handle. And notice the the how the dates okay now the squash shaped rattle and the rattle with a handle. More examples of rattles. We have this one from Chile. This one is made uh, out of metal. Now, more examples of idophones, and this time we're going to talk about bells. This, uh, the image was taken from uh, Sanchez, and we can see how they have, how he used examples from the um, Cody's, Cody's uh, Nutal, and over here you can see it, I don't know if you can notice it, it's, oops, sorry. You can notice it here, that's the rattle, and over here, that's the rattle. Now we have examples of bells, these are from Costa Rica.
more examples of bells. I love this one. This is my favorite one. This one. And um, the last examples, uh, the last, the last example of bells. This one, this idophone. So people may think that they're not examples of idophones, but um, the debate that they were having the 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 researchers was if if. If something is in nature and there's um, evidence that it was actually used, so it becomes an instrument. For instance, you can see this um, stone bells. You can see the marks that it has been played a lot over the years. So that's why they consider it an instrument. <laughs> is um, in Argentina this one is in Bolivia Another example of idophones is the uh, rhythm sticks. We can see them here in, uh, in this piece of ceramic. And we can see it here, how they are use used now. In This was taken in 1968. So now let's talk about aerophones. In this presentation, in this class, um, today we're going to talk about half of the aerophones because um, then we wouldn't have time. So for next month, we're going to continue with the, the rest of the aerophones. Um, examples of aerophones are ocarinas. Over here we have one with the shape of a pig, one with the shape of a monkey, and one with the shape of a crocodile and a bird. And we're going to hear the one, the last one. So as, as, as I said before, you can make the variations of the sounds with the holes. Over here we have um, an ocarina with the shape of a human. So when you when you're listening to here, are the actual instruments that were found um, in archaeological sites. Mm, they, these are not reproductions because that's what the, they recorded. The people that I told you about before, the researchers I told you about, um, they recorded the actual instruments. They played the actual instruments. Now another... Now this one with the shape of a drum. More ocarinas. Again, these are taken from the from Costa Rica. This one is, is um, has the shape the shape of a of a bird.
This one, the shape of a sorrow. This um, example has uh, a crab, crab shape, and this one the shape of a turtle. The first, the first one I uh, I just told you about is is from Costa Rica, and this one is from Costa Rica as well. But this one is in the Met Museum. Now the antaras, the the traditional Andean. Uh, pan pipes I, I'm not very sure on the difference between Antaras, Sikus, uh, Sampolas and Sampoyas somewhere I found that it was it's actually the, the culture how they call them differently and another source I found that is if it's one line of uh, flutes or pipes it's antara, uh, antaras, if it has two, then it's saponas or sapoyas. So I'm not sure about that, what the correct um, term is. Over here, at least in, in this research in the Museo de la Plata, this they call it an, a, an antara. And this one is made out of ceramic. And over here we have um, from our name, another research, uh, Carlos Sanchez. These are um, made out of pelican bones. They're not dated though. He did not date them in the, in the, in the, in the paper, unfortunately. Both particular ones. This example of uh, now. Let's talk about flutes. Um, we have the Kenyan, the Kenas flutes. This example is super interesting to me because look at the date. It's, it's dated 3750 BC. It's considered the oldest archaeological instrument found in Peru. Um, and it's um, it's held in the Museum of Anthropology, at the Museum of Anthropology, in uh, in Peru. So to me, this one is very interesting, not only because it's the how old it is, but also because it has pyrographed um, motifs, which is another one of my uh, interests in research. Pyrography. Talking more about flutes, we have this one from uh, Mexico. Over here we have uh, a statue of a person playing the flute. And then in the center we have one with, uh, uh, and to the right we have a simple one, a single, single tube. And in the center we have one that has um, more than one tube. What is interesting about this one is that we, when we hear it, we're gonna hear the 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 console that we talked about hetero heterophony before. We're gonna hear that to our ears. It's gonna sound out of tune. But since this was a recurrent find, they they're sure that they meant to to do it like that it's not that the artisan that created this flute uh, made a mistake because they have found many many examples of these so let's hear this one
Interesting, huh? So we have now the slight whistles. These are very complex in their construction. And over here we have a um, an x-ray of how they look like inside. What is interesting about them is that when you play them, well, first they're beautiful outside, right? They're highly decorated. But when you play them, you have to move the head to have different sounds. And they say that it's to imitate the birds singing. This was taken from Grupo Mesme. Uh, they have interesting videos on um, Mesoamerican instruments. Over here we have the um, the air spring flute or the what they call Mayan clarinet. You can see it here in the in the X-ray. What happens with this is the air comes into one end and goes to the chamber and springs out through these holes. These holes and mix because the air the springs out mixes with this the air coming in through the small hole so that's what produces the sound both of these are uh, very complex in their construction these are more examples of the spring flutes we're gonna hear an example uh, one that sounds exactly like a monkey Another example of air spring flutes is the death whistle. And I love this one. So when when they first found them in the early 1900s, they first uh, assumed that they were toys or uh, ornaments. But they were only they were exclusively found in ancient Mexico uh, they were found in Mexico so they assumed that they were only used in ancient Mexico they were probably uh, reserved for sacrifices and slaves and they are associated with death rituals because not only because of the decoration of the skull but because um, they were found in sacrificed skeletons in the temple where they were found. The sound that is produced because the sound that you're going to hear is very distinct because it has different air stream. This is a, a picture of the uh, experimental models made by uh, Velázquez. And in this video, we're going to see what, uh, what they sound like. I want to show you this. I want to share with you this. Thank you. 
So, imagine you being a, a fighter and you, you go to war with that. Next we have the, we have the Nama flutes. They look very much like uh, our regular um, um, recorders, right? So, but the only difference is that they have um, decorations at the end. Let's, they're very common and they have a long channel and they usually have four holes. Let's listen to this example. Examples here of the Nawa flutes. This one is uh, from Codex uh, Florentino, the Florentine Codex. And over here we can see the actual uh, instruments displayed in the Amparo Museum. And uh, The last thing I wanted to tell you about today about the, was about the Nawa flutes. Then we have the fiesta, the um, Toscaco. Oh, you can do it, Tegna. Go ahead. Tenosh, go ahead. Toscat. Toscat. And so in this festival, thank you. In this festival, um, a young man personified a god all year round and was trained to play this instrument. And at the end of the festival, he was sacrificed. That's what he, we are seeing here. How he was, and he was, he was praised as a god all year round, and then he was killed at the end. And this is an example on how the instrument was God. God was personalized in this instrument. So for this uh, class, we we talked about we completed the uh, idophones and we did part of the earphones. Next month, we're going to talk about member phones, and we're not going to talk about, um, I'm sorry, and we're going to talk about member phones and quarter phones. Okay. As I said before, the references are in the handouts, and I want to thank uh, the Honorable Lady Anne Elizabeth Morley from the Outlands and Lady Eva from Naroon, the Alnas as well, and Mr. Cecilia for reading the the paper. Uh, I also want to, for reading the presentation, I also want to thank uh, Lord Tenoff for sharing his um, research with me, 
and Lord Tariq for sharing his archaeological um, knowledge with me for this class. That's my email if you guys have any questions or comments. You can email me and that will be the class for today and I hope I see you next week, next month. Do we have any questions? Hey, I have a question. Um, I had a hard time hearing a few of your sounds. When you are sharing your screen, do you have the share sound part on? Uh, I'm not sure. It's up at the top when, when you're doing your share. Oh, that's okay. It, it's, if you download, uh, I can obviously take it, um, take that into consideration for the next class. Some of the sounds are not that loud. So, right. but when you go to the presentation, if you download it, you can hear the sounds. You can hear the audio sounds. Okay. Thanks. Sure. And it's just because that that's how they were recorded. Do I just we... want to say thank you very much. I mean, muchísimas gracias, Slasokamati. Like, just thank you. Uh, it's a lot of work to do this kind of research. I know because I do it, <laughs> and you've done a lot more than I have done in, in many areas. And I, I greatly appreciate you putting this together. I know that whenever I speak to people about this. Um, I usually do more work at the point of conquest, trying to separate what is, you know, what was Spanish, what was European, what was Mesoamerican, but to see how much work you put into identifying specifically pre-Columbian instruments. Um, that is incredible work, and thank you so much for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. I know you're teaching a class pretty soon on actually colonial music, right? Yeah, I'm teaching uh, at Colegio de Iberia this, this next weekend. I think it's on Friday is when I'm scheduled, Friday night. Um, it'll be specifically on like hybrid culture and what happened when basically music conditions combined. And so it's interesting because, you know, you point out the instruments that indigenous people would have used. And a lot of the work I do is how that got introduced into European music. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like, I mean, I have like, I have a yo yo. So I have some of those of so these, I have a rattle, you know, I have some of the stuff you were talking about. And it's really cool to see the different designs that were actually in antiquity. Um, so yeah, thank, I, thank you. It's, it's always really fascinating to see how much other people put into this kind of work and how thorough this research is. I, I think you did a fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, it, it, it's just, a rabbit hole, right? I was my first intent was to share things that most people in the SCA are not do not have access to because of the language. And most of the research I found is done in Spanish rather than in English. So I wanted to open up that door for people that do not speak Spanish and just to show how vast and complex the the Mesoamerican music is. Does anybody have any questions? Any comments? I uh, I find it interesting that um, some of the uh, instruments that I found for um, like toys and stuff for for children. Um, are very similar that four that four flute that four fingered flute that you know no, they're, they're based no, off of the yeah i find that very interesting mm -hmm. and they were very common so who knows what they used them for probably they used them for kids as well because mm -hmm. uh, everything in archaeology as carla and tariq would tell you everything is is um, hypotheses. 
Let me see if there's anything in the chat. Yes, there, there was a question about if it's going to be available online. Uh, yes, it will be. You're muted, George. Tariq, you're muted. Yeah. Should have got the better tech guy. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. Uh, you should fire your tech guy, actually. Um, so this will be available online. We're It'll be at least on the... Uh, uh, the Outlands in the Kingdom University, the ROIU. Uh, I'm not sure where else we're going to put it, but I mean, that's up to you, baby. I, I know it'll at least be there. Yes, yes, it's it's going to be there. All the remember that this is um, this is a series on um, uh, presented by the Stack Choir. The Stack Choir is the Kingdom the the Kingdom of the Outlands Choir. So this is a series of music. Uh, classes that are being offered throughout the year uh, we have had uh, um, and Elizabeth gave a wonderful class before and um, uh, I think that the classes that we've had are, have been incredible so yes and they're all being uh, uploaded in the um, in the university the, the Outlands University Oh. Um, YouTube. Any more questions? No. Nope. So thank you very much for coming. And I hope that this was um, interesting for you. And I hope to see you next month. Remember that uh, if you, some of you may have had a little trouble hearing the video or some of the sounds in during the class. Um, if you download the PowerPoint, all the sounds are embedded so you can actually hear them in all their glory. Mm -hmm. And if you want the sounds individually, uh, I put a file in, in the file that I shared with you. All the sounds are separate there as well. Okay. Thank you very much. See you next month.